I suppose that uh, uh, primarily I'm going to try to address um, the first two questions that Tim raised. Is there a consensus in cognitive psych science of religion? I'm going to say, yeah, there's an emerging consensus. Exactly what the details of that emerging consensus are, we'll still fight about because if we all say that we agree, then we're out of jobs. So, but I think there is an emerging consensus on what I call the naturalness of religion thesis. Um, and I'll make a couple of, of quick comments about what I think it means or doesn't mean uh, vis-a-vis -vis religion, but we have uh, more expert folks in the room who can talk about that more. Um, Jesse Baring has a, has a book that's just come out about a month or two ago called The Belief Instinct. His and Robert McCauley's forthcoming Why Religion is Natural and Science Isn't are two of a number of published works promoting what I'm calling the naturalness of religion thesis. Bec and basically, that thesis is this. Because of the nature of human minds, religious expression in beliefs and practices is nearly inevitable for most people. And so in this paper, I'll sketch the sorts of reasons that lead scholars to conclude that religion is natural and then offer a few comments about that. Um, I won't dwell on it too much. Uh, it's already been mentioned. I'm not real fond of the uh, term hardwired or the term innate. Uh, occasionally you'll see journalists saying, oh, Barrett says that we are hardwired for belief in God, capital G. And I've never said any such thing. Or that uh, children are innate, innate uh, believers in God. No, I don't say that either. Um, I think a more helpful term is a concept that's been developed recently by Robert McCauley, uh, who is a philosopher of cognitive science at Emory University and also one of the founding fathers, if we can say that, of the cognitive science of religion. He uses the term naturalness, and it, in particular he's talking about cognitive naturalness. Macaulay uses naturalness to refer to thought processes or behaviors that are characterized by ease, automaticity, and fluency. Okay, those abilities that require little conscious attention or effort are natural in a sense. And you can see that that sort of maps onto the colloquial sense of natural. Um, speaking your native language, adding two plus two, walking even, natural uh, for us in this respect. Macaulay goes on to observe that, there, that this kind of naturalness, this ease, automaticity, and fluency can come about in, about, in two basic ways. Okay, The first he calls practice naturalness. And he calls it practice naturalness because there's, it seems to, uh, as, a, as an important component of it, have lots and lots of practice, training, tuition, and cultural support. So you get the fluency, automaticity, and ease, but this kind of naturalness requires some kind of explicit tuition typically requires some kind of special artifacts, and by special here we just mean not available to everyone in every culture. Okay? So not that there have to be some artifacts, but special artifacts. If I'm going to learn how to ride a bicycle, and I'm going to develop automaticity, ease with that, I need a bicycle. That's a special artifact, because not everybody has access to a bicycle. Okay? Um, these are relatively late developing traits relative to the, uh, the other type of natural, naturalness we'll talk about. That is, you probably remember learning how to ride a bicycle. And that's what we mean by relatively late in human development. Probably after the first five years, or at least at some point that you can remember not having this trait. So you might remember when you learned how to do algebra, something that's probably not natural for most of us. But even if it is natural, you acquired that naturalness at some point in time that you remember maybe painfully. Okay? This is not a typo. I also, this is one sort of uh, feature that I've added to Macaulay's list. Also, these tend to be traits that are relatively late developing in terms of human species development. Okay? That is, we know that there was a time that people were not bicycle riders, and it wasn't that long ago. You know, you know from a, 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 when, when, when stepping back and taking a broad view. Okay? Where's things like uh, human speech? Well, that's been around an awful long time, okay? Using language. Um, because of these first one, two, three, four, five features, 
there tend to be there tends to be quite a bit of intragroup and intergroup variation in these kinds of naturalness, uh, uh, natural capacities. Okay, so just because I have naturalness in, say, uh, statistical reasoning, maybe I have that. I don't. But if I did. Um, that would surely be practice naturalness. Not many people have it within my cultural group, let alone between cultures. And it can make sense to uh, compare various cultures. We might say that, well, that people in Singapore are just better bicycle riders than people in uh, the United States. Okay? And it wouldn't be a dopey thing to say. It might not be true, but it wouldn't be dopey. But we might say, well, you know, the uh, Canadians are such such better walkers than the French. They just walk better. I mean, that's just a dopey thing to say. Or they speak their native language better. Well, that's, that's, that's odd, right? Because we're talking about sort of very subtle shades at that point. Um, anyway. All right. Now, many forms of cultural expression that we find natural, I've been talking about things like bicycle riding, bear some of these marks. Oh, sorry. I better talk about maturational naturalness first. I'm getting ahead of myself. In contrast to that practice naturalness, Macaulay says, and then there's this other class of stuff. These other capacities, these other propensities that we can identify as being natural, they've got that same fluency, automaticity, and ease, in that sense they're natural. He's going to call these maturationally natural, or talk about maturational naturalness. I know these are clunky terms. And for these, you typically don't need explicit tuition. You don't have to be told the grammar of English to speak English as a child. You just hear it spoken and boom, there it is. Okay? You might occasionally get explicit correction and so forth, but that's not critical. You don't need special artifacts typically. Okay? I don't need any special tools to learn how to speak my native language or to add 2 plus 2 and things like that. These are early developing traits. Okay, typically within the first five years of life, and there is a typical there because there are some that are later developing that we might still say are maturationally natural, just like wisdom teeth are maturationally natural even though they don't show up until awfully late. All right, most of these are sexual kinds of behaviors and capacities. All right, um, these are relatively early developing in terms of human history as well, they've been or prehistory, they've been around an awful long time. And because of these first five, there's very little inter and intergroup. Uh, variability. All right. So walking, talking, adding small numbers are examples of maturational naturalness. Of course, many of the forms of cultural expression that we find natural bear some marks to both the practice and maturational naturalness. Literacy is an example. Requires practice, training, tuition, and writing tools, for instance. <laughs> But it can get so automatic and so fluent that it's hard to turn off, which Stroop tasks, if you're familiar with those, are a wonderful example of. All right. So really what we're talking about when we're, when we're getting to the level of cultural expression is some kind of a continuum. Okay. That now on the uh, left-hand side I've got the really, the, what we might think of as the predominantly maturationally natural kind of stuff. And over here we've got practice natural naturalness. And I'm, for the sake of simplicity and linguistic economy, I'm just going to call those natural. I'm going to call this expertise. Okay? So this is where I'm breaking from Macaulay's usage because I think this is simpler. And I checked it out with him and he said, yeah, that'll, that'll do. Okay? This is pretty close to what he calls expertise. All right? And the reason I'm, I've made this wedge-shaped is because once you get down onto this expertise end, you don't have a lot of people expressing this. Okay? In any form, let alone in a, in a fluent, automatic, easy sense. So it's really hard to do modern science with any kind of expertise, okay? with any kind of automaticity or fluency. It's hard to do chess. Literacy may be somewhere in the middle. Speaking your native language, piece of cake. All right? Lots of people do that. Okay, that's why the, the wedge is, is wider here. And you'll see where I've placed religion, down on that end. Okay? My suggestion is that it bears many of the marks of being maturationally natural. Okay? Though many, if not all, forms of expression we call cultural shows, both of these so signs of both uh, practice and maturationally nat mat uh, sorry, maturational naturalness, not all cognitive systems that underlie these forms of expression have this dual character. 
Okay, so some cognitive capacities, as opposed to the cultural expression that rides on the back of them, are decidedly maturationally natural. And so when I build the case for why is it that I put religion down on that end, I'm going to focus on those maturational cognitive, maturationally natural cognitive capacities that underlie religion, not the expertise related ones. Okay? And Macaulay gives us, in addition to that list, he gives us sort of a good rule of thumb for what's maturationally natural, uh, a, cogn a cognitive capacity that's maturationally natural, and that's um, if your child doesn't have it by the time they're about five, you might call the doctor. So if your child isn't speaking by the time they're five, you might think, ooh, something's wrong, right? They're lacking something maturationally natural. So if your child can't play chess by the age of five, even though you've taught them and you've tried to get them to practice and they just can't pull it off, uh, at least not with any fluency, you're not worried. If they can't speak, you're, there's a problem here, okay? Because these maturationally natural cognitive capacities arise early in development, first as a matter of course, it follows that they're broadly present across cultures in largely similar forms. And so these capacities are the foundations upon which cultural learning and expertise are built later in life. Note that this view of maturationally natural cognition does not entail that some of these capacities are present at birth, biologically determined, hardwired, or innate. None of that applies here. We can be agnostic about all of these things or just say I hate those terms. Okay, some of these capacities could be largely fixed before birth. They could be or impervious to environmental inputs outside of normal biological needs, of course. But other maturationally natural capacities might be largely a product of being tuned up in, by environmental regularities that occur in any cultural <coughs> context. And that's the key to keep them on that maturationally natural end of things. Rocks are solid everywhere. I don't need to be biologically determined to understand the properties of rocks. I can learn those potentially. All right, because they're going to be the same everywhere in terms of sort of their basic properties. Plants require sunlight everywhere. Babies have mothers everywhere. Okay, that might be a social regularity as well, but it's a cross-cultural regularity. So that can be on that natural end of things. Okay, I'm not going to come down on a nativist versus empiricist end, uh, I mean, on, on this debate. I'm going to remain agnostic about this. Okay, what we're concerned with is what are those cognitive capacities that seem to be maturationally natural? leaving aside why they are, okay? So you see that's a big dodge and it's pretty important. So we don't have to fight about modules or innateness or any of that stuff, we just put it aside, all right? The regularity and early development of maturationally natural capacities make me think these capacities map onto what we normally think of as part of human nature or natural cognition, okay? And this is why I'm gonna go ahead and just call them natural and call the other end expertise. We okay so far? I mean, you've had the text, right? Um, the most obvious and least controversial features of natural cognition are general limitations, such as limits on perception, attention, and memory. We know full well from our own experiences that we can't remember everything we might want to remember, whether it's long-term memory or consciously attended to working memory. And this has some important features. We can attend, for instance, to only so many units of information at one time. So in fact, one of the first sallies in the cognitive revolution that began cognitive science was researched by George Miller investigating working memory. His experiments led to the claim that working memory is limited to approximately seven plus or minus two chunks of information. A claim that's undergone some modification but still in the right ballpark. That is, we usually can only keep about seven chunks of information in attention at once and sometimes less than that. Now this chunks might sound crude to you, who, to those of you who are not familiar with the jargon. Uh, it's uh, physicists, this would drive them nuts. Chunks, what do you mean chunks? Well, you've got strings, we can have chunks. Um, it roughly means the largest conceptually meaningful unit a person recognizes. So the digits 0, 7, 0, 4, 1, 7, 7, 6 would be eight chunks if you represent them that way. Or you could rechunk them, regroup them as July 4, 1776, three chunks. 
if that's a date but not a meaningful date to you. Or you might chunk it as American Independence Day. One chunk. Okay. Knowledge then, the background knowledge you bring to a particular set of stimuli, impacts chunk sizes. But big or small, it's still unusual to be able to keep more than about seven or so chunks of information in working memory. Now this observation about working memory being limited has important consequences for perception, thought, and communication. Basically, how we build up knowledge. Applied to perception, a limit on working memory suggests restrictions on how rich a representation of the world around us we can maintain. Simply too much information comes in pouring in at one time for us to attend to all of it. We have the illusion of a complete representation of the world around us, particularly in familiar environments, because we know what should be there. Okay? That is, our knowledge automatically, non-consciously, just fills in the blanks. So we only have to attend to enough details about the environment to trigger the right conceptual information or the right course of actions. If you're interested in this stuff, there's a fun little book out right now called Invisible Gorilla by Dan Simons and someone else. Uh, I forgot who his co-author is. I know Dan Simons from when he was doing these studies with the Invisible Gorilla. If you order now, apparently you can get a gorilla suit, Jeff, um, with your book purchase or something like that. It's this great marketing thing that they're <laughs> pulling off. But it's called this because it's, uh, these studies showed that if you give people sort of a minimally taxing task, like watching basketball players pass a ball around and keep track of the number of times it's passed, somebody in a gorilla suit can walk into the middle of the scene and walk back out, and half of the people don't even notice the gorilla. Okay? These kinds of studies cumulatively show that we don't have that complete a representation of the world around us, even in sort of brute empirical matters. What's there? Guy in a gorilla suit. Don't even notice because it doesn't belong there. Or there are wonderful studies about uh, people misremembering, oh yeah, in that office there was a shelf full of books and there wasn't a single book in the room. But people remember there should have been a book there. There should have been a lot of books because it was an office, an academic office. So they remember there being books there. All right, we fill in the blanks. To get around our working memory limitations in thinking, we then make heavy use of our background knowledge, but also what might be termed intuitive or tacit knowledge. Ideas that we typically don't even know we have, but once it's pointed out, it just seems right. We say it's intuitive. To illustrate, we tacitly know that animals have babies like themselves. Okay, I think I've got, oh, we'll get to this here. Dogs, for instance, have baby dogs. Cats have baby cats. This fact is so banal that it is rarely stated, nor does it even need to be stated, and that's an important point. If I tell you that a manabee in the local zoo had babies, I don't need to tell you that it had baby manabees instead of baby wallabies. That information is there automatically, tacitly, intuitively. In fact, you also tacitly know that the manabee moves to obtain nutrition, has parts inside of it that make it go, is made of organic matter, is a bounded physical object that can't pass directly through other objects, and a host of other pieces of information. I've put some of these up here. Not only do you know this, so does a five-year-old. Okay? They know all of this stuff, too. And you know this even though you've never heard of a manabe before because I made it up. All right? It's completely fictitious. And you don't need to, but you can fill in the blanks. So this intuitive knowledge is built in helps chunk anything else you learn about Manabe. All right? It fills in the blanks so it doesn't take up precious memory, working memory space. All right? You don't have to, when I say, oh yeah, the local zoo had Manabe, I don't have to detail all these things for you for us to have efficient communication. It's just boom, automatically. This extra conceptual information gets smuggled in free of charge to working memory. And because of this, it serves as an important prop for communication. Real-time, face-to-face verbal communication makes working memory demands that could easily outstrip seven plus or minus two chunks, if not for conceptual information that can be assumed and make bigger chunks. Okay? So, I don't have to tell you that the manabee, once I tell you that the manabee at the local zoo gave birth, I don't have to tell you that it grows, requires food, and the rest. I only need to communicate enough information to trigger this conceptual background information and trust your mind to fill in the rest. All right, but if I'm trying to tell you something that you don't naturally possess background conceptual information about, then I've got to specify it, okay? I have the increased burden of detailing all this information and you have the burden of keeping enough, in it, uh, enough of it in working memory at that time that it can be comprehended and encoded into long-term memory for you to later use. 
It follows that ideas that are largely composed of conceptual building materials we already have are more easily and readily communicated. Ideas that deviate from our intuitive knowledge require more effort, attention, and repetition, or other what you might think of as devices for successful communication. All right. So my argument in, in short then is religion spreads well, it's everywhere, because it's using all of this sort of already available kind of information. All right, this intuitive knowledge that's there. In contrast then to the general cognition, these working memory limitations, we, all, we have these limitations and tendencies when it comes to specific domains of content, what might be called content-specific cognition. So not all information about all topics is treated the same way. And in my experience, this claim is more surprising and more controversial. So allow me to provide two examples to make the point. I feel like I have to do this in almost every talk, convince people, because there's always at least one of you in the room who is not going to believe me. All right. Um, usually anthropologists don't believe this at all. Right? Isn't this right, Rich? Uh, sociologists don't. Mo a lot of psychologists don't believe it. So here we go. All right. Humans and monkeys have a natural disposition to become afraid of snakes. There's one example. It's very easy for a person to become afraid of snakes compared to flowers or butterflies. That is, becoming afraid of flowers or butterflies. Okay, so people have been shown to rapidly detect snake-like objects and to be readily conditioned to fear snakes, even when they're not consciously aware of having seen the snake. Infants readily associate snake, snakes with fearful stimuli. When presented with a photo of a snake and another animal, like a hippo or something, and they hear a voice speaking in a frightened tone, the content doesn't matter, this is an infant, they don't have language yet, they preferentially look at the snake, not the other picture. But not when the voice uses a happy tone. Oh. If you suspect that this rapid fire association is due to cultural proclivities or particularities, Consider this, monkeys ra raised without exposure to snakes in captivity can acquire a long-lasting fear of snakes merely by watching another monkey react in fear to a snake. One time. That's, that'll do the job. I have to put this in because I think the last time I gave this kind of talk, somebody said, no, people are afraid of snakes because of patriarchal society and not going to give this big story. Like, no, that's not it. <laughs> we don't need to go there. Okay. But you can't readily condition someone to become afraid of flowers, or a monkey for that matter. All right? And why might this be? Of course, we can spend some kind of adaptationist story. Um, you know, that it's good to avoid these guys because they're not terribly good for eating, but they're terribly dangerous if they're the wrong type, yada, yada. Okay? So we seem to have some kind of a natural proclivity or bias to become afraid of snakes. And maybe this was an adaptation of some sort. All right, that's a content-specific kind of area. It has nothing to do with general working memory limitations. It has to do with a particular kind of area, it's things to be afraid of. Here's another example. Newborn babies differentially detect faces and imitate their expressions. From immediately following birth, within hours of birth, human babies already attend more to human faces in their environment as compared with other sorts of things out there. The baby in the delivery room bassinet would rather look at mother's face than a pile of rags, or the colorful wallpaper, or the nearby sphygma manometer. All right. Even more surprising is that within a few hours after birth, babies can imitate some facial expressions, such as sticking out the tongue or some of these others. All right. And think about what's involved with this. Among the blurry mass of novel stimuli, right? This is a baby fresh out of the birth canal. A baby detects something in her environment, the face, maps the thing's appearance and movement onto her own facial musculature to create a comparable expression. Now there's a lot of excitement over mirror neurons as the mechanism that does this kind of thing, maybe, maybe not. But the point is this, the baby doesn't even know it has a face, right? It's got lousy visual acuity and yet it's doing this kind of thing. Spotting and recognizing other human faces is terribly important for human social success. And so having some natural biases that give an advantage in processing faces as compared with, say, trees, potatoes, or the faces of cows and chickens would be helpful. All right? And so most of us have it. And I do say most of us. Apparently, there's a small percentage of the population who don't have this. 
So you just have to learn it. Um, oh, and by the way, there's, there's also within 24 hours of birth, there's a sex difference here. Okay, that little girls, babies in particular, like to look at faces more than little boy babies do. That's not because of patriarchal societies either, as far as we can tell. I mean, it's okay. This content specific facility with human faces persists into adulthood. All right, and that's the point. With a lot of these content specific biases or tendencies or dispositions, they end up structuring the rest of learning throughout life. Okay, these two areas then of content specific natural cognitive bias are just the tip of the iceberg. But I hope they illustrate the key point. The mind as a whole is not helpfully compared to a blank slate only limited by capacity. Rather, our minds preferentially attend to and differentially process some types of information over others, handling different domains of information in different ways. Based on these considerations about human cognition, that we have processing limitations that force us to rely on tacit knowledge for perception, communication, and learning, we would not expect religious ideas concerning supernatural agents, for instance, to be massively widespread and enduring, as they are, unless they had close relations with knowledge structures that humans naturally possess. Reflective beliefs, whoops, we'll get to that. Um, now, that's just about what things you think about and can communicate well. But of course, people don't just think about religious ideas, like they think about folk tales or fairy tales and things like that, but they actually have these beliefs. This actually turns out to be a very short step from entertaining ideas a lot, or them to be intuitive seeming, and believing them. Our consciously entertained and affirmed ideas and propositions oftentimes are obtained through the automatic deliverances of these intuitions. In fact, maybe that's how it happens most of the time. Uh, philosophers aside, of course, they don't do that ever. Um, but as Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman's work has shown, if an idea readily comes to mind, it has that familiar intuitive ring, it seems right to us and we're inclined to accept it, what he calls accessibility bias. Ideas that are part of content-specific natural cognition will be the large pool of ideas that people have in common across cultures then. Thus, natural cognition anchors and forms the range of likely reflective beliefs, these sort of step back reflective beliefs people will hold. Natural cognition provides the default positions for reflective beliefs then. It's hard work to reason, right? We have to be trained to do it and have the time and energy to do it. And so we're inclined to just accept intuitions that we have for our reflective beliefs. For instance, when confronted with a question that we've never consciously considered, for instance, do you believe that snakes are dangerous? Maybe you've never thought of that. You might have no explicit reflective belief one way or the other, but you need to come to a decision. So unless relevant information, such as from previous education in zoology, comes to mind, most likely reflective belief will be that option that's consistent with rele relevant natural cognition. If thinking about snakes triggers an association with fear and danger, as is often the case, then the non-reflective intuition, snakes are scary, seems right, and serves as a starting point or default for the reflective belief, snakes are scary and dangerous. How about the question of whether or not people have conscious thoughts? Maybe it's never occurred to me to think explicitly about whether other people have conscious thoughts, and I've not been exposed to related philosophical ruminations or philosophy of mind problems in this regard. So how do I form the reflective belief? on the subject. Well, I tap my intuitions and discover the intuitive idea, people have conscious minds. Finding no reason to reject or override such an intuition, I accept it, at least initially, as my reflective belief. In the absence of salience, relevant, consciously accessible reasons not to do so, reflective beliefs are simply read off of natural intuitions. For more complex propositions, or those not immediately delivered by our natural cognition, credence increases with the cumulative support of various ideas automatically delivered by natural cognition. An idea that manages to resonate with many different natural intuitions will just seem right. Okay? My argument is that beliefs in gods have this co type of cumulative cognitive support. So then I better get to what are some of the features of a natural cognition that seem to be particularly important for religious ideas and hence make religion natural. Cognitive scientists of religion have identified a number of features that collaborate to make religion natural, particularly the way we identify intentional agents, the way we reason about minds and bodies, and our tendency to search for purpose in the natural world. Okay? Importantly, all our cognitive faculties that are foundational 
for the way humans make sense of their world and life in it. These aren't add-ons. These aren't expendable. These faculties just are sort of intrinsic to how humans operate. I'll just focus on uh, these five very quickly uh, that are highlighted here. Humans have a strong natural propensity to focus particular attention on the difference between the actors and the props of the world, or between agents and objects. By agents, I mean persons, minded beings that act based on mental states, such as beliefs, desires, and percepts. From infancy, babies are sensitive to this difference between agents and objects. Arguably, as social beings, selective attention to agents and trying to understand and predict their actions is critically important for human thriving. For this reason, our cognitive systems for detecting agents and our system for thinking about actions might be especially eager to find those agents out there and find signs of agency. This hypertrophied social mind has been noted by many cognitive scientists of religion as playing a critical role in religious expression. In fact, I don't know any people who call themselves cognitive scientists of religion who do not think that sort of hypertrophied social mind is not important here. I think this is definitely a consensus of position. Uh, Jesse Baring's new book, for instance, he thinks that's it. That's the whole story. Um, Stuart Guthrie can be argued to be saying this is the whole story right here. I've termed this system for detecting agents and their activity the, um, whoops, wrong way. I'm going the wrong way. How, who, hey, how do I go the other way? Oh, I see. Move down. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. I've termed this system for detecting agents and their activity the hypersensitive agency detection device, or HAD. I apologize. Um, <laughs> Evidence that humans have such a system and that it can be trigger, easily triggered is very strong. Uh, Stuart Guthrie has, so I won't, I won't convince you. Stuart Guthrie has argued that the human perceptual and conceptual tendency to human see human-like agents, that's Stuart down there, um, see human-like agents and agency everywhere, even in situations we later recant, as in shapes moving around a, uh, a broken rectangle there from Hyder and Simmel. Um, is an example of a better safe than sorry kind of tuning, or what's become known as error management. Guthrie's argued that this tendency to find human-like agency where it does not actually exist sometimes is a primary generator of belief in gods. Okay, so we have had experiences, I like to call them, experiences in which we detect agency for which the type of agency is unclear. Uh, I'm detecting some agency here, but I don't know who done it. Uh, it doesn't seem like a human, doesn't seem like an animal I know. And then these sometimes get regarded as evidence of a god or gods. So our natural cognitive systems find minded agency even where there is not any and are likewise attracted to intentional explanations for natural events and states of affairs. Gods by these lights are false positives. But even if one is uncomfortable with Guthrie's decidedly dismissive approach concerning the possible existence of one or many gods, his general point I think is helpful. Our natural cognition readily applies purpose purposive and mentalistic construals to a broad range of objects, states, and events, even given only ambiguous evidence that mental agency is in fact at play. Note that if it didn't do this, we might not think each other have minds either. Right? So that, I mean, let the philosophers fight about that one. But um, if one has been exposed to a God concept, and if in principle the God's activities are detectable in the world, then one's agency detection system has a good likelihood of detecting evidence of the God's activity, at least occasionally. Similarly, given that had is more forgiving of false positives than failures of detection, one will occasionally encounter events or conditions that seem to cry out for an explanation in terms of the activity of an intentional agent, and a regular human or animal will clearly be insufficient. Such events might occasionally lead to the postulation of a god. I think more probably they're going to support the existence of an already known god. Okay, So it's not clear if this is a generator or just an encourager of these kinds of beliefs. Once agent is detected, the theory of mind system, or TOM for theory of mind, generates a host of intuitions regarding the motivations for the alleged actions of the agent. TOM, or sometimes called folk psychology, includes intuitions about what others are thinking, what they perceive, what they want, their emotional states and beliefs, and the relationships among these various mental states. Okay. Though thinking about the minds of other people might be the most prominent activity for Tom, 
Tom does not require the agent in question to be physically present or visible, even in young children, as research on imaginary friends shows. Okay, so invisible God's not a problem for the theory of mind system. I've detected agency for some reason. I'm ready to roll. If an event or state of affairs is processed as being the product of an intentional agent by had, Tom picks up the task of determining why the agent in question did it. What was he thinking, or she thinking, or it thinking? A common class of states for which such reasoning seems natural is the arrangement of the natural world, it turns out. Through numerous experiments, Deb Kellerman at Boston and colleagues have produced considerable evidence that children exercise what she calls promiscuous teleology a tendency to find design and purpose in the natural world beyond what parents license. For instance, children are inclined to say rocks are pointy, not because of some physical processes, but because being pointy keeps them from being sat upon and crushed. Using teleological reasoning to account for the origins or causes of things extends to such living things as plants and animals and non-living things such as rocks and rivers. Okay, and what I've got up here ooh, uh, are just some examples of some questions that she asked children and the kinds of answers that children gave in an open-ended kind of task. She has all kinds of different really clever experiments showing that children have this real strong attraction to what she calls teleofunctional explanations. And interestingly, she's recently produced evidence that adults that have not been formally educated show a similar preference for such explanations, as do scientifically educated adults under conditions of hurried response including professional scientists. Make them answer quickly. They don't just randomly create errors. They create errors in the direction of errors, in the direction of teleological explanations. Okay. These results suggest that promiscuous teleology is not simply outgrown, but it's, only, but it's tamped down under some cultural context. That is, it's natural to favor these teleofunctional kinds of explanations for things. See purpose, see design, see there's, there's a goal to this stuff. And we have to unlearn that, okay, or tamp it down. So, perhaps not surprisingly, this teleological reasoning often finds a comfortable fit with the idea that the purpose was brought about by an intentional agent or creator or creators or the forest spirits or whomever, okay? We're not necessarily, this doesn't necessarily point toward a cosmic creator but that there's someone out there who, or some ones who order the natural world in some way. All right. Uh, actually, this is an idea you can find threads of in Piaget from a, about 100 years ago now. The difference is that Piaget thought this led children to think that humans were the ones responsible for the natural world, and more recent research shows they don't go that way. All right. So taking Guthrie and Kellerman's work together, we see that humans have a natural intuitive impetus for postulating gods. Events and things in the world appear purposeful, designed, or otherwise the product of minded intentional activity. It's also been speculated that events of unusual fortune and misfortune likewise provide motivation to consider the existence and activities of gods. When some improbable event happens that seems meaningful, we might readily assume that someone, perhaps a divine someone, is responsible. I'm uh, not there yet, but I'll let you look at the pictures anyway. Uh, such thinking could be reinforced by moral intuitions. There's some speculation on, along these lines that psychologists have discovered some evidence that we easily think about the world as operating on some kind of reciprocity principle, what's sometimes called just world reasoning. If someone does something morally wrong, something bad is more likely to befall him. Okay, children seem to have this intuitions and so do adults, but why? One way of theologically elaborating this intuition is to postulate a punishing and rewarding force such as karma, as we see in many Asian religions. Alternatively, a fairly intuitive account would be that someone knows about the wrongdoing and punishes it, someone capable of this kind of punishing. Gods might know even what's done in secret and can use natural forces and things to reward or punish. And, so, and gods may serve an explanatory role in these cases of unusual fortune or misfortune. Even gods that have little concern about human interactions may be vengeful when humans trespass against them. We often think of it as, you know, God sort of sitting back there and morally concerned in our interactions with each other, but in, I don't know, it might be safe to say most places, the gods really just care that you violate them or not, and not necessarily care very much about what you do to each other. All right. But still, they can account for why things go wrong. 
The natural tendency is to see agency around us, to see purpose in the world, to demand explanation for uncommon fortune and misfortune, and to connect fortune or misfortune to reward and punishment, may conspire to make gods readily understandable and provide impetus for entertaining their existence and activities. That's the basic story. But one further uh, set of considerations deserves some mention here. Many, if not most, of the world's gods, broadly construed, bear some relation to deceased humans, as their ancestor spirits or ghosts. And that one time they were humans, just like you and me. In small scale and traditional societies, warding off ghosts and malevolent spirits, propitiating the ancestors and guarding support of deceased saints often takes on far greater importance in regular practice than concerns about creators or cosmic deities. Psychologist Paul Bloom has argued that humans are naturally intuitive dualists, regarding minds and bodies as separable entities because of representational conflicts between two different conceptual systems that generate inferences regarding the properties of humans. One system, dubbed naive physics, deals with solid bounded physical objects and is present in the first few months of life. This system registers human bodies as objects with certain physical properties, and then the second system deals with mind and agents, theory of mind. It's not concerned about bodies in the same way, but with minds. Bloom argues that these two systems and their differential developmental schedules, their different evolutionary histories, and their different input-output conditions are only tenuously united in thinking about humans, leading us all to have sympathies for dualistic kind of reasoning in terms of minds and bodies. And, likewise, readily accommodating thinking about disembodied minds and something of us persisting after death, such as souls or spirits. Becca has a, a different kind of angle on this that I think is, is somewhat interesting, too, and, and has some legs. If we accept that our natural cognitive equipment makes us intuitive dualists in some sense, as Bloom has suggested, then the idea that an immaterial something, mind, body, or spirit, or some combination thereof is left behind is not radically counterintuitive, actually somewhat natural. But even if such dualism is not an intuitive default, but just merely easily accommodated, the point remains that mind and soul-related ideas are not difficult to decouple from bodily reasoning. The fact that somebody's body has stopped working need not conceptually turn off reasoning about the person's thoughts, feelings, desires, and other properties. As Pascal Boyer has noted, with someone intimate, we know a lot about their tastes, desires, preferences, personalities, and the like. And upon death, these mind-based properties remain untouched. Our theory of mind system, informed by such information, continues generating inferences and predictions even after someone has died. It doesn't have the same off switch. We can see when a body falls apart. We can't see when a mind falls apart and decays. So it keeps going, is the argument. Propositions about there being one or more gods that are responsible for some of the purpose we detect in the natural world fits easily with ordinary natural cognition. Either our brains or our environments need to importantly change for people to not have natural dispositions towards some kinds of religious ideas. Okay, that's my claim. Now, the naturalness of religion story doesn't end there. It could be that once these cognitive factors converge, uh-oh, <laughs> I didn't do that, that wasn't me. Um, it could be that once you have these cognitive factors in place that converge on ideas about gods or afterlife or whatever that we call religion and that generate then subsequent behaviors on the back of those kinds of ideas that these behaviors prove adaptive and are hence reinforced through natural selection. I'm going to save that kind of explanation for Rich because he's the true expert on this of, of, of how these, uh, uh, these kinds of religious ideas might generate religious behaviors that then turn out to be adaptive in some ways. Um, and we're probably cutting too fine grain when uh, trying to decide whether or not uh, religion then is an adaptation or an exaptation or what's going on there. Uh, we can discuss that later. But I raise that because it seems to me for, uh, what is it, our question number three, what does religious naturalness of religion mean for religious freedom? Part of the answer is going to depend on where you place the emphasis in the naturalness story. If, it's, if religion is natural, if it's intrinsic to human expression because it's been reinforced, because it's adaptive for, say, social coherence, for creating tr larger trusting and cooperative communities or something along those lines, the answer to that question might be very different than, oh, it's natural because of the cognitive factors, full stop. Okay, but we can talk about that. 
At least it seems to me there's at least a different discussion there. Okay, implications then. The exact details of how religion might be natural are far from settled. I'm trying to sort of give you my version of it. Um, like I said, I think that my version that emphasizes more the cognitive side probably can be married with uh, the, what uh, Rich emphasizes on the uh, adaptiveness side. But then the question is, does this naturalness bear upon whether religious expression should be afforded special freedoms? For, inter for instance, in contrast with other forms of cultural expression. Um, if this scientific research into the cause of religion entail that religious expression thus explained is therefore false or irrationally held, we might not be comfortable with affording it special liberties, I suspect. Uh, so then, uh, an important question is, do such explanations explain away religion? And uh, uh, if you can read this, here's a little quote from Jesse Baring's new book. Um, I won't read it for you. Basically, he just is saying, look, it's our theory of mind that gives us the social brain, so that's what uh, generates these ideas in God, and therefore there's no God. It's not an argument, but it's an assertion. Um, it's standing in for a tacit argument, I think. Um, in fact, he ends there with this. It may feel as if there is something grander out there watching, knowing, caring, perhaps even judging, but in fact, that's just your overactive theory of mind. In reality, there is only the air you breathe. Um, and many new atheists drawing upon cognitive science of religion to attack religious belief seem to be committing, I think what they're committing is a version of the genetic fallacy that William James warned against at the start of his varieties of religious experience. So here's what James said. Um, the, the backdrop of this is James is noting that from methodological naturalism, all mental states have biopsychological cause. All of them. And identifying it says nothing one way or the other about whether they're good or useful or true. All right. So according to the general postulate of psychology just referred to, there's not a single one of our states of mind, high or low, healthy or morbid, that ha has not some organic process as its condition. Or we might say an evolutionary background for it. Scientific theories are organically conditioned just as much as religious emotions are, and if we only knew the facts intimately enough, we should doubtlessly see the liver determining the dicta of the sturdy atheist as decisively as it does those of the Methodist under conviction anxious about his soul. When it alters us in one way, the blood that percolates it, we get the Methodist. When in another way, we get the atheist form of mind, James says. He goes on to suggest that maybe uh, when our blood is at 103 degrees, we actually think more clearly, not less clearly, and all these things. And that really what we're coming down to is whether or not uh, it produces good kind of outputs that we can confirm or reject in some other way. For cognitive and evolutionary explanations of religion to bear upon whether one ought to believe, they need to do more than explain that the brain or evolution or cognition was involved with such belief. That just isn't new information, right? We all suspected that. Pointing out that these scientific findings imply that people would have religious beliefs whether or not they weren't tr were true won't do the job either. And uh, I think this, first, it's far from obvious to me at least that this claim is an implication of the science at all. It could be that religious beliefs are a byproduct of evolved cognition only because of divine mind behind the natural order. And if there was no such god or gods or whatever it is, our minds and beliefs would be very different. We just don't know. Uh, second, a huge number of natural beliefs would be undercut by the same kind of logic. We appear to have a natural evolved disposition to regard others as having minds, causation to be unidirectional and real, color to be a real quality of objects, and so on. Arguably, we would and sometimes do believe such things whether or not they were true. If so, should we jettison such beliefs as well? And maybe, I mean, some cognitive scientists argue, yes, we should. Um, but if we do, will we have enough pre-scientific commitments available to get the scientific enterprise that allegedly undercut such commitments off the ground? I'll leave it to the uh, philosophers of science to worry about that one, but I suspect not is the answer. So arguments from the naturalness of religion against religion need to show that the psychological antecedents are untrustworthy or otherwise suspect in their belief-forming activities, not just that they are. 
just, just pointing that they exist, not enough. You need to show that they're suspect or untrustworthy, and it isn't clear that one can do this without already taking some stand on the quality of their products. Consider a household scale. I might suspect that it gives a bad reading for any number of reasons, but I can't determine that it's in fact error prone without independently determining the weight of an object and then showing that the scale does not give its true weight. Just dropping a bag of potatoes on the scale saying, see, the scale says 10 kilos. That's not right. This scale is no good. We would only be convincing if we already knew that the sack of potatoes does not, in fact, weigh 10 kilos. If our cognitive systems weigh our experiences and conclude that, conclude that there's at least one God out there, we can't take this conclusion as evidence that the cognitive systems are mistaken unless we have independent reason to think that there are no gods. That's be question begging, right? Indeed, normally we would regard such a weighing as evidence that there is at least one God. If we weigh our experiences and we come to the conclusion that there is a God, usually we take those intuitions at face value. Indeed, uh, reflecting on recent findings from the cognitive science of religion, contemporary theologian John Calvin writes, uh, there is within the human mind and indeed by natural instinct an awareness of divinity. This we take to be beyond controversy. God himself has implanted in all men a certain understanding of his divine majesty. Ever renewing its memory, he repeatedly sheds fresh drops. Indeed, the perversity of the impious, who though they struggle furiously, are unable to extricate themselves from the fear of God, is abundant testimony that this conviction, namely that there is some God, is naturally inborn in all, and is fixed deep within, as it were, in the very marrow. As theologians often do, he's misreading this, the science. It doesn't say inborn. Maturationally natural, maybe, but not inborn. <laughs> But otherwise, you can see that, I mean, Calvin in some ways is playing the same game that Bering is doing. Um, and as far as I can tell, they're sort of on equally safe footing. And maybe, maybe, uh, but we, that's something we can talk about. So it seems to me then that the best the anti-religionist is left with building a case from world, is, would be building a case from worldview coherence. I think that's, that's the way to go. Um, that is, arguing that these particular findings from the cognitive and evolutionary sciences are more at home with a materialist worldview than a religious one. Uh, building such a successful argument might be possible, but I think it faces at least a couple of formidable challenges. Most difficult might be the problem that the naturalness of religion seems to be unwritten by, underwritten by the same cognitive systems that gives us a host of mundane commitments, such as the existence of other conscious minds, orderly intelligibility of the natural world, predictable causation that are required for most materialist worldviews as well as religious ones. So be careful of collateral damage. If religious thought were born of a wholly unique cognitive mechanism or adaptation that could be cut away without broader epistemic costs, then I think the anti-religious project would surely have an easier chance at success. And maybe here is where cognitive versus adaptationist explanations might be worth looking at as somewhat different. Um, but not acceptationist. I think when we're sort of putting the two together, then uh, the same observation applies. So while we wait for the anti-theistic argument to de be developed, how should we then regard the naturalness of religion thesis? I suggest that we do what we do with our other intuitive beliefs, regard them as innocent until proven guilty. Insofar as beliefs in the existence of gods are fairly direct natural outcomes of ordinary human cognition, they may be regarded as justified until reasons arise to reject them. And of course, reasons do arise for many of them. Um, what about religious freedom then? Let us suppose that scientific accounts of the naturalness of religion are on the right track and do not entail that religious beliefs are false or irrational. What implications then does the naturalness of religion have for religious freedom? I confess no special expertise. I didn't even think about these kinds of things at all until Tom and Roger cornered me over dinner and tried to convince me that there are connections and it seemed like fun. So here I am. Um, so I'll leave it to you, the more informed people to, to draw the right uh, uh, conclusions here. But just to stir things up, um, let me suggest that um, well, let me just make a couple of observations. Let's suppose that the adaptationist or ex exaptationist accounts of religion, such as signaling theory that hasn't been presented yet, but Rich will, are correct. That is that belief in gods in the afterlife serves to make people more cooperative and pro-social, at least toward their own community's members, or something like that. And that's part of the story of why religion is natural. Suppose, too, that in fact religious expression was a device that helped humans build larger scaled societies as has been suggested by various evolutionary theorists. 
what would the consequence of now forcefully removing its cohesive presence from society, right? If that's part of how societies, big ones in particular, have been built, what's going to happen if you try to pull it out of there or tamp it down? Well, we might imagine that some new devices could be engineered to serve the same function. Um, but if religion is indeed part of an evolved gene culture complex, then we have no optimism that artificially invented substitutes for religion would successfully serve the same role. At least I don't. Particularly without creating friction with the natural dispositions that religious cultural expression rides upon. All right, if there's an assumption, um, as, as Tim pointed out, that if this is completely artificial, okay, we're just dealing with a cultural level kind of phenomena. There is no gene culture story to tell here, just the cultural level. Well, yeah, you can imagine you might be able to change this and get the same results. You might be able to come up with a new device that holds people together, makes them cooperate and so forth. Maybe that's right. But if the people who are emphasizing the adaptationist side say, no, 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 there's, there's a gene culture complex here that's evolved, that's been reinforced selectively, well then I'm less optimistic. There will be unintended consequences that we can pretty much expect. And arguably we've seen such attempts to replace religion with other socio-political devices. Um, but for them to be successful, even minimally successful, they seem to end up taking on many of the trappings of religion. And I have here various leader cults that have been developed by secular sort of totalitarian societies. All right, they end up importing a lot of sort of religious ideas and uh, uh, practices. So even with these sort of marginal successes, since most of them don't seem to last more than a a uh, few generations. It appears that all of these movements have been unable to entirely suppress religious expression and have borne the cost of dubious human rights records. But let's suppose even if religion does not play any natural social function that cannot be, su that cannot be supplanted, what about the natural cognitive dispositions toward religious expression? Okay, so I'm putting aside that it might be adaptive, might be an adaptation in any, or an exaptation in some way. What then? Well, in most people and in most cultural environments, we might predict that all people, oh, sorry, that people will continue to entertain religious beliefs, engage in religious practice and identifications of various sorts, and link these religious expressions to core personal values that bear upon one's public actions, even when they're being publicly discouraged. What governmental discouragement of religious expression is likely to do in such situations is move people away from developed, established forms of religious expression to more idiosyncratic or marginal forms of expression, or adopt proto-religious ideas or practices. Because it's not the case, of course, that full-formed religions just sort of pop out of these natural dispositions. They're built upon the foundations of these natural dispositions. And hopefully, they're sort of refinements of natural dispositions, elaborations in ways that either are useful or seem more true, more functional, uh, more right, more good, and so what happens if you tear down the structure and you still have the foundation? Or you cut down the tree but you still have the root that's going to keep sending up sprouts? Well, arguably that's what we're already starting to see in some parts of Western Europe. At least uh, in a conversation I've had with Rodney Stark, this is sort of one of his, his way of merging his view on the, the secularization thesis and the cognitive kind of stuff. He reports evidence of this kind of shift taking place in, secularized Western Europe. For instance, he says, look, in the last 30 years when we've seen this enormous move in the UK away from established religion, what do we see? An equally large rise in neo-paganism, astrology, and belief in ghosts. Okay, and those kinds of things. So you might think of more natural religion, more refined, less refined, right, less developed. And is that a good thing? Well, that would be an interesting an interesting question to explore. Okay, I recognize these musings regarding the naturalness of religion and freedom of religious expression don't deal directly with normative questions of whether naturalness of religion supports or challenges the positions. These are more pragmatic observations, I think. Rather, I've speculated with regard to what the consequence of religious suppression might be. If the suppression is difficult or impossible without these undesirable and intended outcomes, pragmatic arguments for suppressing religious freedom might be weakened. So that's my story, um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much.